In his State of the Nation address, President Cyril Ramaphosa said that the ANC plans to have a consultative public discussion to explore the merits of the ANC, a conference a resolution on land expropriation without a compensation. And joining us to take that further is our studio guest, Theo Boshoff, who's the head of legal intelligence at AgBiz, as well as Professor Cyril Mbata from UNISA, who joins us via Skype. Uh, Prof, perhaps let me start with you. Uh, you share the uh, first name with the president, yet you don't necessarily agree with his uh, means or his uh, way to want to return the land. What's your position on this? I must also say that I share the, uh, my second name with the new finance minister, Tlantla. So, so yeah, so I've got uh, I mean, my interest in both in both parts there. In any case, no, um, I think really the issue that's been confronting the ANC is in terms of it meeting uh, its own targets that were sent uh, that were set in the uh, uh, land summit in 2005. And I think uh, we've, uh, the government has failed on, 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 on two fronts. One is to transfer land to uh, people who were forcibly removed on that land under the restitution as well as the redistribution uh, uh, cases. Um, and another one is that the land that ha has been acquired has not been used uh, in a manner that uh, 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 the policy under the redistribution uh, program aims to use uh, the land economi economically and, and, and productively. So, so I, I, I think that what uh, the ANC is going towards now is just going to model the progress that has been made or rather complicate the issues under the land reform project in such a way that it's uh, going to be even more difficult uh, for us uh, to meet the targets that were set in, 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 in 2005. And in some way, I think that it is shifting the responsibility away from the state because historically the state has participated in the uh, cementing, legitimizing of the uh, status quo in terms of uh, ownership patterns uh, in the country. In fact, most of the land that was stolen is owned by the state itself. So for now to uh, say that we're not going to be compensating for the land that uh, uh, is being uh, 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 expropriated for me, it does, not, uh, it does not sound irrational. In fact, I don't think it's even moral. Uh, so I don't think that it's technically, it's technically uh, possible. For example, if, um, if, if the land uh, that is identified uh, is now owned by one of the historically disadvantaged groups, say, for, exa for example, colored people or Indian people, or even another black group of people, because the, 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 the apartheid government segregation was about making sure that the races, not just black and white, did not uh, live together. So how would you approach that? Would you then identify Indians or coloreds who are historically identified as uh, previously disadvantaged, people who do not uh, deserve compensation for land that's being expropri expropriated from them? Well, let's actually try and discuss the uh, how. A very difficult uh, task indeed. But of course, Theo, uh, you at Agbiz, uh, your team, have written some research as to how they could go about doing this. Because from yesterday's ruling, it looks like, you know, it is going to be changed by the, uh, the Constitution and the ANC is pushing forward with this. How should they do this in a way that will not create any, any, any havoc or any further uh, anxiety or any form of violence here in South Africa? Yes, I, th I think it's a very complicated question to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, when we started the research, we initially looked at the ANC resolution and specifically the wording. Um, there was never any clear documents detailing exactly what the decision meant. We simply knew that, they, that the intention was to amend the, amend the uh, expropriation provision in the constitution, but it has to be economically viable. So now there's quite a lot of scope of what can be done in between that, and we weren't exactly sure what, the, what, what that entailed. So what we tried to do is using a scenario planning based approach. We try to look at uh, the best case scenario as well as the worst case scenario and everything in between, both from, e from an economic point of view as well as a legal point of view. So, of course, the, the worst case scenario, as, y as you mentioned, uh, violence, for example, if it, if, if it does get to the manner that uh, if the decision remains undefined uh, for a prolonged period of time, it could be the case that people take the law into their own hands, mm -hmm. which, which will, of course, happen outside of the law. Uh, what, what we're seeing now, I think, 
with this move that's, that's happening in Parliament is not necessarily that happens outside of the law, but simply that the rule of law is maintained. So in other words, through non-violent means, but the Constitution is amended to, to allow for expropriation without compensation. Now, on the economic front, so whilst that might be better legally, economically it still poses significant challenges because the financial sector which finances agriculture places a large reliance on the value of, of the land as, as collateral. Mm. But, uh, you know, Prof, I suppose you will and agree that essentially if, and you did say that if land was taken, you know, was essentially stolen from people, it should be returned. But now you have a scenario whereby the government is asking a person who owns the stolen land right now to uh, maybe uh, perhaps give it back or even sell it back to the government at market related prices. And this owner doesn't want to do so for perhaps justifiable reasons. They're asking, I mean, if I sell, where do I go? Uh, how do you address that scenario? So there are a number of proposals that have been put forth previously as to why the government has struggled to acquire land. And, 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 and some of those include the fact that the current owners uh, of the land have asked for prices that are higher than market related prices. So that, that's purely agreed. Uh, in some instances, it could just be inconvenience. Uh, who knows, in worst case scenarios, like, like I say, maybe it's racism. Um, so I think in those instances where land is identified uh, through the, the, the land courts um, and, and the communities um, is proven that they were forcibly, forcibly removed from that land. Government uh, has now set up since 2014 the evaluator general that can actually go in and uh, evaluate the wealth of, of the land without having to negotiate with the current owner of the land. And in instances, in any case, there could be instances where even if land is identified, but that land still cannot be, can, can still not be given to the people who, 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 who claim that land for various reasons that there could have been a city or a mine or whatever uh, it could have been that is now established on that land. Then in those instances, government needs to compensate the, the communities who who, who, were, who, who are deserving or who were removed from that land. So it's various scenarios, but my, my, my take is that this needs to be within legal frameworks. It needs to be morally justifiable. And then, and then your other guest is correct to say that then the land afterwards needs to be used uh, productively, especially in cases of uh, land redistribution. Uh, in cases of restitution, well, it depends on the individuals and communities that then, that then receive the land, how they decide to use either the land itself or the financial compensation that they get. So, for example, I would agree with the EFF that we cannot measure the successes on how the land that's been expropriated is then used afterwards by communities, especially under restitution, where, where, where there could be instances that in the same way that we cannot tell people how to use the financial compensation that they get. We can also not tell people that people have got various options. They could use the land for burial uh, uh, purposes. They could use the land for worship. They could use the land for tourism, whatever. Uh, but under redistribution, where the aims are clear that the land needs to be used for productive uh, economic uh, 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 activities, then there the government can come in well, uh, well, it looks like we've lost a bit of connection there. But Theo, perhaps you can just uh, quickly just paint a picture for us. I mean, how much land is out there? I think the, the rough estimates is about 122 billion uh, hectares in South Africa. But one must also remember that there are legitimate other government needs for land. For example, nature reserve, national, uh, you know, national parks. And then, of course, you also have to look at the, the quality. If we, re if we refer mm -hmm. specifically to agricultural land, the two off. You know, or, or sorry, two off. Two thirds of, of South Africa's land, you know, the Kalahari and the Karoo, is essentially des a desert or semi-desert. So it is very important, I think, not just to, to look strictly at the figures, but but look at the potential of the land that's transferred, mm -hmm. and also, um, and I completely agree with Prof. With restitution, it's it's slightly different because that is uh, the social justice is the primary primary aim to return the land. But with the with the redistribution aspect. It's, it's vitally important that the areas of South Africa, and we only have about 13% of the country which is actually arable, uh, that is, uh, and, and even less than that, about between 2 or 3% that's genuinely high potential agricultural land. It is essential that the land reform beneficiaries are empowered to use that land productively. Now, in this regard, expropriation or compensation can pose some, 
uh, some serious challenges, and, and specifically with access to finance. Mm. I mean, we are, whether we like it or not, we're living in a, a globalized uh, society, and our agricultural sector is competing globally against other countries that are highly subsidized and receive a, a great, great amount of assistance from both financial and non-financial. So to try and achieve that, the agricultural sector has had to stay right up there in terms of technological development and also use scale benefits to try and achieve economies of scale. Mm -hmm. And a large part of that is access to finance. Mm -hmm. So the new beneficiaries, whilst they might be ex uh, very well endowed in terms of being able to, to f farm productively, it's also vital that the financial sector still places reliance on uh, agricultural land as an as a asset group to try and to uh, provide credit and finance to enable them to have a a modern, sophisticated agricultural business. Mm. Yeah. Well, this is obviously a developing story. We're going to be talking about it for a very mm. long time, so let's just leave it there for now. But Thea, thanks so much for your time. Many thanks to Prof. Cyril Ndlandla Mbata, who is the UNISA Graduate School of Business Leadership, and also Theo Boschoff, who is head of legal and intelligence, or legal intelligence rather, at AgBev.